We've been talking in this chapter about finding difference methods applied to parabolic partial differential equations where the solution marches forward in time. So far we've been looking at spatially one-dimensional problems in order to look at various aspects of explicit methods, implicit methods, numerical stability analysis, and so on. But now we need to look at multi-dimensional problems. We'll look specifically at two and we'll talk about how to extend these to three dimensions as well. In this video I'm going to look at the first order explicit method and the first order implicit method and how they would be applied to multi-dimensional problems evolving in time. And then in the next video we'll look at ADI or alternating direction implicit type methods which we had talked about first for elliptic equations and now we're going to adapt for these parabolic equations. And we'll look at a couple different alternatives. For now we'll look at the unsteady 2D diffusion equation. All along we've been looking at the unsteady one-dimensional diffusion equation which would not have the y derivative. Now we're going to include the y derivative and so you now you can see this is the Laplacian. In fact if you get rid of the time derivative this is the elliptic Laplace equation. So one thing you'll notice this is discussed down here we actually kind of have an elliptic type behavior because of the Laplacian here as well as the parabolic behavior because of the directionality in time. So we kind of have this dual character, but they really are parabolic equations because they evolve in time. However, you're going to see some similarities between what we'll do here in, in terms of handling the two-dimensionality as compared to what we did with elliptic methods for multidimensional problems. As always, we'll have to have an initial condition. So at t is equal to zero, we'll have some distribution of the dependent variable u as a function now of x and y throughout the entire domain at t is equal to zero. The boundary conditions then all the way around the boundary could be Dirichlet, Neumann, or mixed as we discussed in the previous chapter. And now we have an additional challenge in terms of representing these graphically. So we have a two-dimensional plane, which will be in the page, and then time is going to be up out of the page. So you see here, for example, here's my x, y coordinates, my spatial dimension. We'll use the same notation as we did for elliptic problems, i going from 1 to capital I plus 1, j going from 1 to capital J plus 1. So we have capital I and capital J intervals in each of those two directions respectively. And then time will be out of the page. So let's first talk about the first order explicit method. So we'll apply the same principle as we did for the one dimensional case, but now to two dimensions. So to draw this, I'm going to draw time going up and then my five point stencil at the nth time level in these horizontal planes. So remember that the x marks the spot for explicit methods is at the previous time step, at the nth time step. And all spatial derivatives are done on this five point stencil at the nth derivative. So on the right hand side we have the partial squared u partial x squared, so that's going to involve these three points. We use a second order accurate central difference approximation so 1 ui plus 1j minus 2 uij plus ui minus 1j over delta x squared, just as we saw in the elliptic case. And then for the partial squared u partial y squared term, we'll do the same thing, but now in the y direction, so involving these three points. So uij plus 1, uij, and ij minus 1 with the 1 minus 2, 1 coefficients. You'll notice all of these are at the previous nth time level where we know the solution. And then we use a forward difference in time, which is only first order accurate. It's ui j n plus 1 minus ui j n over delta t. It's only first order accurate. You see that down here. Second order accurate in space, first order accurate in time, just like in the 1D case. Put the unknowns on the left, the knowns on the right and we get our explicit expression for uij at the new time level n plus 1 in terms of stuff that we know. There's just more terms now on the right hand side that we know. You'll notice now I had to define an sx and an sy because I have a delta x and a delta y. So sx is alpha delta t over delta x squared and sy is alpha delta t over delta y squared. So you see that over here on the right hand side. Now if you do a von Neumann stability analysis, remember in the 1D case the requirement for the first order explicit method to be numerically stable was that s had to be less than or equal to a half. The equivalent requirement is that the sum of the two s's, sx plus sy, has to be less than or equal to a half. So if you think about that, for example, if delta x and delta y were the same, then sx, sy could just be regarded as s then that would require that s be less than or equal to a quarter. 
So by increasing the spatial dimensionality of the problem, we've actually hurt ourselves in terms of numerical stability. Going to three dimensions, it gets even worse. So this is very typical of explicit methods. Now for the first order implicit method, remember the X marks the spot is at the N plus first time level. So now all the spatial derivatives are taking place at that N plus first time level. That's where the five point stencil is. And then we use a backward difference in time for the partial U partial T term, just like in the 1D case. When you do that, you simplify, put all the unknowns on the right, the knowns on the left, you get this expression here. Now, why didn't I go through this in detail? Because look what happened. We now have one, two, three, four, five unknowns at the n plus first time step. So rather than being tridiagonal, we actually have five unknowns. And so it's gonna look something like this. A tridiagonal system, you would have the three diagonals in the center that would have non-zero values. Now we also have these fringes out here and here with a whole bunch of zeros in between. So there is a structure to it. It's still a banded matrix, but it's no longer tridiagonal, and I can no longer use, therefore, the Thomas algorithm to solve our implicit equation. So this is not ideal. It is unconditionally stable for all values of Sx and Sy, so that's good. We could also apply the Crank-Nicholson method in order to get a second order in time scheme as well. I'm not gonna go over that here because there's actually improvements that we can make that you'll see in the next video.